Okay, welcome to the virtual competitive algebra seminar. Uh, we are happy to have uh, Professor Thomas Polstra from University of Virginia uh, for his second talk on F singularity and the deformation problem. Thomas, you are welcome to uh, deliver your seminar for one hour, and we will have question answers at the end of your talk. All right, wonderful. So uh, thank you for having me again, uh, speaking in this seminar second time. So, so yeah, I want to, so for today's talk, it's definitely it should be thought of as a continuation from last week. Um, we're going to be still very much interested in the same type of objects, very same type of notation. Um, so here in a second, I'll remind us of our notation in just a second. But uh, but yes, today I want to focus in on F singularities and the deformation problem. So specifically, what I want this talk to be is I want it for those who aren't as familiar with prime characteristic commutative algebra. I want this this talk to serve as kind of a, a rough introduction or a, a small introduction to the arguably the four most important so-called F singularity classes. Just a very brief introduction. I'd also like for someone kind of new to this to take away from this talk that the property being Gornstein and these rings is incredibly nice. Um, this was something that was hinted at last week. But when it comes to this subject, the Gorenstein condition is, is golden. It buys you a lot um, in this line of research. And then, um, and then the other thing I want to do is just tell you a really nice story. There's a really fun, really beautiful history to this deformation problem when it comes to the F singularity classes. The story isn't complete, but we do know a lot. And I specifically want to tell you of my contributions to this story of the deformation problem coming from this paper right here called F purity deforms and Q Gorenstein rings, which is kind of the punchline to the main theorem today. Um, but a lot of the presentation style will be following this uh, set of notes with Lin Chuan Ma that I talked about as well last week. Um, okay. So the notation and assumptions is going to be the same as last week. <clears throat> so capital R is always going to be a Noetherian local ring with maximal ideal M residue field K. Uh, we are in this prime characteristic, this prime characteristic world, so we're characteristic P. And so what we can do then is like last week, is we have this Frobenius map F or iterates of the Frobenius app map. So for every natural number E, we can take F to the E from R to itself by raising elements to the P to E's power. And this is an honest ring map because of the characteristic assumption. Um, we always make this very mild assumption, but running assumption that all of our rings are so called F finite, which means that this Frobenius maps are finite morphisms. And then uh, we had this notion of restricting scalars along the Frobenius. So, so if M is an R module, say viewed as a you know as an R module on this right copy of R, then we could turn it F E lower star M is the more R module viewed on this left copy of R under Frobenius just by restricting scalars under the Frobenius. And when you do this this type of game, there's a very important class of examples to consider when you do this restriction of scalars. So, <clears throat> um, which is, if you notice, if you start off with a regular local ring, all right, regular local rings have the Cohen Macaulay property, and it's not difficult to see that if R is Cohen Macaulay, then Fe lower star R is always a maximal Cohen Macaulay R module. Hence, over a regular local ring where everything has finite projective dimension, we get that these modules are always free. Fe lower star R is free, provided you're in a regular ring. And then the fundamental theorem of this entire subject, uh, arguably, is the reverse implication of that statement due to Kuhn's going back to the 1960s, which is the Frobenius detects regularity. So in this F finite local scenario, being regular is the same thing as saying F below star R is free. And that motivated our discussion on F regular rings, and this will further motivate our discussion on uh, the so-called F pure rings, F injective rings, and F rational rings. And so we'll get into that. And then the other kind of big running assumption is if we talk about a module in, same thing as last week, unless we specifically talk about a local cohomology module or the injective hull of the residue field, we, M is going to be finitely generated. And then the other bit of notation, D is preserved to be the dimension. All right. 
So that's 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 the, the language we use, and then let's talk about our F singularity classes. So, so the F singularity classes. All right. So regular is being detected by Frobenius, and the regular condition is that F e lower star r is free. So being non singular just means this module is free for us. Uh, F regular. We talked about this last week. Um, so as a reminder, the like heuristically, F regular just means F e lower star r is not necessarily free, but has lots of free subbands. Just being very uh, heuristic there. Okay. And then we saw this, what this really, you know, the, the formal definition is that we could take for example, this is a definition. Take any non-zero element of R, then for every E big enough, uh, there exists uh, a map phi so that you get a commutative diagram. So we have R, so we have our Frobenius map to F e lower star R. Then we can multiply by C, right? And as long as you do this for E sufficiently big, you have this existence of a map like this. So there exists phi. Everything's R linear in sight, and then this is the identity map. All right, so you get this nice commutative diagram like this, sending F e lower star C and this copy of F e lower star R to one in R. Right. Now, this ends up being equivalent to the following. So this goes dates back to work of Mel Hoxer from the, the 70s and understanding when a map is pure. But uh, this ends up being equivalent. So we have this, you know, as a reminder, we have this E as the injective hull of the residue field. And so the injective hull is going to be a big role, play a big role today. So this is going to be if and only if the following holds. So for, for all E sufficiently large, R, OK, so let me give myself a little space. All right, so we have R mapping to Fe lower star R by Frobenius. And then we have this multiplication map by C. And to say that we can get this existence of a splitting map phi for E sufficiently big ends up being completely equivalent to saying that if we base change, or not base change, but the tensor with the injective hull of the residue field, uh, these things are all one-to-one. -one. Injective. Right, so the, this map induced by Frobenius and multiplying by C, if you, if you tensor with the injective hull, that thing will be injective. That's equivalent to the existence of the splitting. And that gives a different way to talk about F regular. And this will help us make lots of connections under the Gornstein hypothesis to other singularity classes. All right, so F rational. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna give a slightly non-standard definition of F rational that doesn't involve necessarily the tight closure of ideals. So I'm going to give it kind of a tight closure independent definition, but it is equivalent to the original definition due to Mel and Craig back in the 80s and 90s. But uh, but it's going to more mimic this, this type of definition up here. So we're going to say it's F rational. Um, all right. So very non-traditional definition, but I hope we're okay with this. So for all non-zero elements of our ring, for all E sufficiently large, um, oh, I forgot one assumption. So we need one assumption, R needs to be Cohen-Macaulay. Okay, and so there's a Cohen-Macaulay assumption always inside the F rational condition. So R is Cohen-Macaulay and for every non-zero element, for all E sufficiently large, we have, all right, we have our Frobenius map. We have multiplication by C. Okay, now instead of base, not base changing, but instead of tensoring with the injective hull of the residue field, we'll tensor with the top local cohomology module. It's a very non traditional definition, but I hope we're okay with this. Um, these things are one to one. Um, now, I am going to make kind of a remark here since we are dealing with the top local cohomology module. 
and uh, tensor products preserve co-kernels. So a top local cohomology module is a co-kernel. It's the you know, top check cohomology, which is an honest co-kernel and tensor products preserve co-kernels. This as a group is just HDFR. And this, this map right here is still just labeled F to the E, but this is so-called Frobenius action on the top local cohomology module. But these, these identifications going down vertically are only as group isomorphisms. All right, but in particular, what we should observe though, is if uh, this, this definition of F rational is very much similar to this definition of F regular uh, involving the injective hull. And so what one should observe is if, is under the Gornstein hypothesis. So if R is Gornstein, right? So which means one way to say Gornstein is uh, Colomacaulay and the top local cohomology module serves as the injective hull, then um, what we should notice is that this F rational and F regular are equivalent. So F rational, same as F regular. Yeah, let's be a little bit, I'm being sloppy, just do that. Implication. So, uh, so, okay. Now, all right, so the third F singularity class that we're gonna have is this idea of F pure. So regular just means F e lower star R is free. F regular means F e lower star R has lots of sum ands, so to speak. F pure just means one sum and, at least one sum and. So F e lower star R has at least one sum and, which I'll just write like this. And this is for one E or equivalently for all E, just getting one free sum and. So, um, which is, this is gonna be equivalent to, um, for all E, there exists a map phi so that you get a commutative diagram. So R to F E lower star R. So this is the Frobenius map. And then we're gonna have this existence of a maps phi. This is the identity, right? So remember with F regular, right? The only difference was you would go out further by multiplication by C. So here the, the C we're taking is one. So, but we're just doing that pure and it's a much milder condition than F regular. And then this will be if and only if R to F E to uh, F E lower star R. Okay, you take this Frobenius map, tensor with the injective hull, and just like with the F regular type conditions, uh, being F pure is if and only if the Frobenius map induces an injective map after you tensor with the injective hull. All right, and then that brings up the notion of F injective. So F injective just means that the Frobenius map induces one-to-one -one maps. of local cohomology. This is as groups. All right, and so in particular, once again, if you're under this condition of Gornstein, so if R is Gornstein, okay, so which means Colin Macaulay, or all these local cohomologies are zero, I less than D, and HDMR happens to serve as the injective hole of the residue field, then, then uh, the, the condition of F pure is equivalent to F injective. Okay. All right. So those are the four singularity classes and let me summarize kind of the implication. So, so we have our most desirable singularity classes, regular. Then we have F regular. We had this notion of F rational that we hit on. And then we talked about F pure. And then lastly, F injective. 
And there's implications here. So regular is always F regular, F regular is always F rational, F regular is always F pure, F pure is F injective, and F rational is F injective. And then moreover, you can, what we, oops, wrong way. And then we notice we can reverse these, if, these two horizontal implications if R is Gorenstein. So this if Gorenstein, Gorenstein. And then uh, in general, F pure is not gonna imply F regular. Um, F injective will not imply F rational under suitable hypotheses. Um, and then uh, very interesting enough, there's no implications from F pure and F rational. Like there's classes of F rational rings that are F pure, classes of F pure rings that are, F, that are not F rational. Um, and so there's no implication between those two. And this is something I learned from the literature from a paper of Watanabe. Um, and then uh, producing F pure rings, which aren't F regular, you can do like the cone point of say the ordinary elliptic curve. This is classic type instruction. Um, but the other thing I want to give an indication of is when did these singularity classes come about, like historically? So, so these two on top, F regular and F rational, these came out of tight closure theory. So these are late 80s and early 90s for these top two. Give you an idea how long we've been thinking about these things. Um, F pure is the oldest of these four singularity classes. Um, this this really came about in work of in the 1970s uh, of work of Mel Hoxter and Joel Roberts, and then the theory of F injectivity popped out of Richard Fetter's work in the 1980s, 1980, the 1983 paper where Fetter was very interested in F pure singularities that we're going to talk about in more detail in a couple minutes. Okay. All right, so those are our four singularity classes that we're interested in. We have this F regular, F rational, F pure, F injective. And so now I want to move on to this line of research known as the deformation problem. All right, so the deformation problem in commutative algebra. So what does it say? So, so the deformation problem. So... What is it? So suppose P is a property of, of local rings. Suppose P equals property of local rings uh, that can't, or a property that can be enjoyed by a local ring. So for example, um, for example, you could take regular as a property that could be used to describe a local ring. Gorenstein is a nice one. Cohen Macaulay, uh, normal, uh, domain reduced, Whatever, uh, complete, it's another good one, et cetera. Um, so we say P deforms um, in, in R if, um, or in a class of rings R, if uh, R has property P whenever, whenever, there exists a non-zero divisor X and R such that R mod XR is P. All right, so let's talk about a couple of examples. So examples, all right, so the property being regular, Gorenstein and Cohen-Macaulay all deform. If you gave me a non-zero divisor in a local ring R, and you told me R mod XR was a regular local ring, that already implied R had to be a regular local ring. You can't do that outside of the regular scenario. Same thing with Gorenstein. Uh, if you have a non-zero divisor so that R mod XR is Gorenstein, R had to be Gorenstein. Same thing with Colin Macaulay. So nice standard calculus exer or not cal uh, uh, exercises for commutative algebra. And then a uh, non-example. All right, so the property being complete does not deform and does not deform. I mean, it deform, I mean, it, it fails to deform in kind of a dumb way, which is um, take a, any one dimensional domain that's not complete, mod out by a non-zero element, you get to a zero dimensional ring, every zero dimensional ring is complete. Uh, but I'll give some more interesting examples of 
fit of properties that don't deform on a loop. Okay. All right. So, so the problem we're interested in, of course, in, is what is the behavior of these F singularity classes and under the deformation problem? And it turns out to be a pretty interesting line of research. So what about F singularities in deformation? And this is a very interesting story. So lots of history here. All right. And there's lots of conjectures. There's lots of counterexamples produced. There's lots of theorems being proved. It's, it's a really cool story. So, and the for me, I would say the story dates back to work of Richard Fetter in 1983, or 1983 publication. So this is, I want to focus on what Fetter had to tell us. In this paper, um, I'll give a proof of something that he does, one of his main theorems, uh, just to give a feel for how some of these type of arguments are going. And then uh, I'll keep surveying history until we get up to modern day. So Richard Fetter was very interested in the following conjecture. Uh, so if you read the introduction, he was this was the main motivation of his research. So we'll call it conjecture A. So, and it's the, right, so 1983, right? If you look at these, you know, if you consider those four F singularity classes, which were on the other page. So remember, two of them came out and you know, the F regular, F rational came out in the late 80s, early 90s. The F injectivity is something Richard Fetter defines in this paper. And so at this time, he was, you know, out of those four F singularity classes, the only one of interest to him at that time was the F pure. And he was very interested in the following. So if we have a normal local domain, normal, and X and R, a non-zero divisor, then R mod XR, oh, if R mod XR is F pure, if R mod XR is F pure, then R is F pure. And the way this uh, is F pure and normal, excuse me. Yeah, you just, yeah, so if you start with a normal domain, quotient out by something, a non-zero divisor, you get a normal F-pure ring, then your ring was F-pure. That's what the conjecture was that he was very interested in. Um, and, you know, Fetter wasn't able to really answer this. Um, but instead, he showed a couple of other things. So, so first off, we already observed that. Um, so what did Fetter do? So Fetter defined F-injective rings. In this paper, um, he uh, also proved the the thing that we observed that F pure is if and only if F injective in Gornstein rings. That was the other thing he did. F injective in Gornstein rings. All right, that was this observation that we saw before the injective hole being the top local cohomology modules. What makes this work? And then the other thing that, you know, among the stuff being done in that paper, um, Fetter does prove the following theorem. Theorem, so this is Fetter, and I'll give an idea of how this works. So if R is Colin Macaulay um, and X and R is a non-zero divisor, then R mod XR, oh, if R mod XR F injective, then R is F injective. And so the way we would read this theorem as a sentence is we would just say F injectivity deforms in Cohen Macaulay rings. And so this is probably the first bit, I mean, this is the first big result when it comes to deforming these singularities. Deforms in CN rings. And let me give you an idea of the proof. So I do want to do this proof. This is a, it's a great proof and it also gives a lot of insight to what the strategies have been to trying to prove that injectivity forms. But so proof or sketch of. So, so the idea is this. So we have, um, you know, there's non-zero divisor X. And so what we're gonna do is look kind of the standard short exact sequence of this thing. And what we know is 
is that if we look at the Frobenius map on RMOD XR, that's going to induce injective maps of local cohomology. And so the way this proof is going to work, so we'll put another copy of that short exact sequence down below it. And then we're going to try to fill in some diagrams to make this whole thing commute. So if we take the Frobenius map on RMOD XR to get this rightmost map to our uh, square to commute, you just need the Frobenius map on R. And now, if you want to make this last map commute, so if you chase the diagram, one goes to X and then X goes to XP to the E. Whereas if you want to make sure that one goes to XP to the E, when you chase the other direction of the, the diagram or the square, you're going to have to put XP to the E minus one times up to the E to make this whole thing commute. And then you can then look at what happens at the level of local cohomology modules. And what ends up happening is, all right, since we're Cole Macaulay, the first non-zero local cohomology module is this. And then we're at the top of cohomology of R. This will be multiplication by X here. We'll get the same thing below it. All right, so we have a Frobenius map here. And remember, this is what is one-to-one -one by assumption. Okay, and then if we fill in the rest, this is gonna be multiplication by X P to the E minus one F to the E. And then this is just the Frobenius action on the top local cohomology. And so what actually happens here is not only is F to the E injective, but we can actually, what ends up happening is something much better is that this map ends up being injective. So claim, is that x p to the e minus one f to the e is one to one, which of course and then implies that the first map has to be one to one. So 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 f so if r mod x r is f injective and r is going Macaulay, then r is actually something better than just f injective. Something stronger is happening. Um, Okay, so claim X B minus F E is one to one. So else what we could do since we're dealing with Artinian modules, you could, you know, else, you know, you pick a non-zero element in the kernel of X P V E minus one, F the E, intersect the socle. Okay. And so in particular, this implies X eta is zero, which implies, right? So if you know, if our element starts in here, it gets mapped to zero here. And so it actually had to come from the lower local cohomology. So I'll just write it as this since there's an injection. But then this implies x p to the e uh, minus one f to the e of eta is not zero because this is one to one, this is one to one by the Colin Macaulay assumption. And so there's no way it could have gone to zero and that's a contradiction. Can't happen. Right here. Okay. <clears throat> but yeah, that was uh, Fetter's proof that F injectivity deforms in Colin Macaulay rings and a lot of good insight there. All right. All right, so that's what I wanted to summarize about F injectivity or from Fetter's paper. Oh, modulo one corollary, F purity deforms in Gornstein rings. Because F purity, F injectivity are the same in Gornstein rings. And then, oh yeah, I, I also wanna say is better did produce some counterexamples to deformation of that purity. Um, Fetter produced counterexamples. Not to the conjecture, but to the deformation of F purity. F, F purity. Um, so, so there exist rings R with, with, which, uh, uh, which are not F pure, but emit have non-zero divisor x such that 
or mod X star is a sphere. However, his examples aren't optimal in the sense that, I mean, they, they, they're not even uh, domains. I mean, so they're pretty far away from the conjecture assumptions of being normal. Okay, so it's, so, so I think from Richard Fetter's point of view here, the, the, the initial conjecture that he was interested in, even though he was able to say something about it, um, namely one, F purity, the forms and Gordstein rings, but there's actually no normality assumptions in there. You can do this for any Gordstein ring. It doesn't even have to be a domain. So that was kind of nice in terms of that conjecture. He introduced this notion of F injectivity, which is very prominent in community algebra now. And um, he also produced these counterexamples of the deformation of F purity, but his counterexamples left the world of being a domain. All right. So time is going to go a little bit forward here, and we're going to hit the late 80s, early 90s, and tight closure. This tight closure gets developed. Tight closure is developed, um, which means we see this notions of F regular and F rational come about. Out. And in this, this development of the tight closure theory, uh, Hoxter and Hudeke just showed that F rationality always deforms. Always deforms. All right, so in terms of these four singularity classes, um, if you're interested in the deformation problem, F rational rings, we understand what's going on. It always works. We're good. Deformation problem is done for one out of four of the singularity classes. At this point in history, and this is late 80s and 90s, is when this is happening. All right. Now, Hox and Hunicke, they have this explosion of their tight closure theory. There's a lot, they, they have a lot of students. There's a lot of influence worldwide in terms of some mathematics being done. A lot of people get really interested in this stuff, and a lot of tight closure, characteristic P papers, connections with the MMP are being made as, it, as we progress into the uh, late 90s now. And uh, a lot of Mel and Craig's influence on other people starts to really show and we start seeing some other results concerning this deformation problem. So, for example, in a paper that appeared in the late 90s, so this would be Averbach, Katzman, and McCrimmon, is uh, in this, I believe, is a 98 paper. Um, so F regularity deforms in Q Gorenstein rings. All right, so we should take a moment to say what Q Gorenstein means. So, so if R is Q Gorenstein, and it's a non-zero divisor, so the R mod X R is F regular, and R is F regular. All right, so what is Q Gorenstein? We should say what this is. All right, so, so, so for Q Gorenstein, so I want you can get away with less than what I'm about to say, but um, if R is normal, but for to talk about a Q Gorenstein ring, I want to at least talk about a normal domain for today. So if R is normal, so we talk, so we have this divisor class group. Um, the assumptions that we make on our ring will imply that. Our ring is, admits a canonical module, and since it's a normal domain, we have what is called a canonical divisor, say Kx and class R is canonical divisor. divisor. So what this means is that you can look at this so-called divisorial ideal, and this is isomorphic to a canonical module of R. Uh, and then, uh, so to say we're Q Gorenstein just means, well, let's say what Gorenstein means. So Gorenstein, so this means Cohen Macaulay and uh, Kx is the zero element of the divisor class group, which is the same thing as saying that the canonical module is cyclic. It's only general, it's a principal ideal. 
Now, Q Gornstein is a vast generalization of this idea in normal domains. Um, we drop, we don't need the Cohen Macaulay assumption. We only require that there exists an integer n such that n kx is linearly equivalent to zero, which is the same thing as saying this divisorial ideal is principal. And this is the same thing as saying that if omega r, all right, so we're in this situation where we can choose our canonical module to be isomorphic to an ideal. So this is an ideal of pure height one, pure height one. Um, and we can take the honest, like symbolic power of this height one ideal and get a principal ideal. All right, so Q Gornstein is just pushing the Gornstein condition or to generalization of that condition in normal domains. And as a reminder, what happens here is in 98, Averbach, Kasman, and McCrimmon show that under this hypothesis that kind of resembles Gornstein is, uh, F regularity has no problem deforming. But something else very interesting happens around the same time. And this is due to Anurag Singh. All right, so Anurag Singh produced some amazing counters. This is coming out in a paper published in 99. So there exists uh, normal domains, normal domains, uh, lot uh, R, which are not F pure, not F pure, uh, not Q Gornstein, now, in particular, since it's not F pure, it's also not F regular, because F regular is much better than F pure. Um, but there exists non zero divisor such that R mod XR is actually F regular and Q going C. Um, and so, what this is showing is that in one set of class of examples, um, this shows the following properties do not deform. So, um, so, so um, F regular, F pure, and Q Gornstein fail to deform, fail to deform in normal domains, in normal domains. And so this conjecture that Fetter was very much interested in is very wrong. So conjecture A is false. A is false, right? This F purity does not deform in normal domains. Um, but the nature of how of the failure of Anurag's uh, Anurag Singh's examples um, makes it apparent and clear that the, the right, and also combining the Averbach, Kassman, and McCrimmon result, the conjecture A that's false now that F purity doesn't deform in normal domains, there's, there's the right, the tweak of it should be that F purity deforms in Q Gornstein rings. So F purity deforms in Q Gornstein rings. So Gornstein rings, okay. It's the, the new conjecture that popped up, I would say. Um, okay, now with this in mind, a couple more years go by, there's a really wonderful paper that comes out in the early 2000s, uh, uh, Watanabe. Okay, and they make a remark in this paper. So they were interested in studying F regular and F pure rings in comparison to some singularity classes coming out of the MMP of log canonical and log terminal. Um, but they make a remark, which is they notice the following. So but they don't write down the proof, um, is that uh, F purity deforms in Q Gornstein rings whose index and I'll say what index is in just a second, but you might be able to guess this, whose index is not divisible by P. So there's like some divisibility assumptions coming up. Back P. All right, and so the just the index 
uh, equals the least integer, least positive integer. So least n such that uh, n k x zero. Okay, so they said as long as that n is not divisible by p, f purity is going to deform. And so this pretty close to getting conjecture a prime at this time. Um, but I do want to make a remark. So the proof is officially recorded by Carl Schmid. Uh, Thomas, there's a remark yes. by Keishi okay. Watabe. Good. I, I, I want to hear this. About yes. an example of two-dimensional F-rational non-F-pure uh, ring. Uh, and uh, so, sorry, uh, divided by non-zero divisor, give f pure rings. In what was? 1987, I published. Oh, 19. Oh, so if R is F rational, I didn't know this. Yeah, F rational, and there is so non, uh, non zero divisor, and R mod X R is F pure. Ah, then R is F pure? Interesting. Not, uh, who? not F pure. R is not F pure. Oh. Oh, oh, there exists an example. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh thank you. I did not know this. The example, this is an example of R being F rational. See, this is why I love giving talks in front of yeah. experts. Yeah, this, time. this is before I was born. Yeah. Uh, so who is this due to? Yeah, uh, at that time, we believed uh, F rational, uh, rational singularity may uh, imply F purity. Mm. So oh, at this, that time, <laughs> so this broke that. Oh, yeah, this broke. of course, uh, this is false. But okay, nice. thank you. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. And so this was due to you, I'm guessing. Is that correct? Okay. All right. Um. Yeah. Okay. So that's interesting. Learn. Good. Good. I'm glad I got to learn that. All right, good. Um, okay, so at this point in time, oh, oh yeah, and so I will say the proof is officially recorded by Swede. And I think it's 2009 at the junction paper. But there's this uh, F purity deforms provided we know the index is not divisible by P. Now I'm not going into that proof, but let me give some indication of what is being exploited inside this, the, it provided we had this assumption that P doesn't divide the index. So, all right, so if, all right, so the following are equivalent. Um, so R is Q Goinstein of index not divisible by P. P and then the other one is all right. So imagine you're you know, trying to study this F pure condition, right? So you're trying to study if this module has a free sum in, and so it makes a lot of sense to study R linear maps back to R. So in other words, it makes sense to study these types of modules, the palm set from F equals to R to R. Um, and what they observe is so, right? So you can view. Well, I'll just say. It. F equal star R, and this is for infinitely many, infinitely many. But um, this is one of the big expectations in this fact is that um, being Q Gorn C of index not divisible by P is equivalent to saying that these HOM sets are the uh, up to isomorphism are the same as these these modules, and that gets exploited in a very critical way in these arguments. Um, and that's all I want to say about them. Um, but at this point in time, this, you know, when it comes to the deformation problem, let me kind of summarize what's known and what's open and what was expected at this time. So deformation, so status of the deformation problem. Deformation of the F singularity classes. Okay, at this point in history. So, so the first, thing we have, all right? So this is, I would say, is a done problem at this point. 
Um, we know it deforms, so it deforms in T. Gornstein, deforms in T. Gornstein, and the nature of Anurag's uh, counterexamples to the deformation of F regularity outside of the Q. Gornstein condition really shows that this is the optimal natural condition to, to, to always expect deformation. Two, we have this notion of F rational. This was always the forms. This is a done problem as well at this point. All right, I went back to Hoxton and Hunicky. Three, F pure. Uh, very close to being done at this point. So conjecture, uh, so the conjecture A prime deforms in Q Gornstein rings. But it's still not done. We only, you know, there was this index assumption. So I'm gonna say okay if index not divisible by P. All right, and then four F injectivity. All right, so this uh, so the conjecture here, I'll call this conjecture B. Um, the, the conjecture here is still, we still expect this to always deform. So F injectivity should always deform. Um, and it's you know, the, probably the, the strongest result, or not the best result, but the first result was due to Fetter. This is okay if R is Cohen Macaulay. That was the proof we went over. And then there's lots of partial results um, um, uh, coming out of this. Um, but um, you know, there's work of Lin Chuan Ma, Fan Hong Kui, Alessandro Gustafani. On this, there's this paper, um, forgetting all the names. But, but when it comes to partial progress on this conjecture, so trying to prove that F injectivity deforms outside of the CM case, there always seems to be this um, effort to try to adopt, uh, adapt uh, Fetter's proof outside of the CM scenario, which is they, you know, not, right. So in the CM scenario, we end up with this short exact sequence of local cohomology modules after taking local homology modules, just because of vanishing results. Uh, the, the, the partial results where there aren't necessarily vanishings of the lower local cohomology modules, they're, they're all based around showing that the lower local cohomology modules in the exact sequence actually split off into short exact sequences. And then they do like some, a different version of Fetter's trip, but on the lower local cohomology. Okay. Um, and then of course today, um, based off the title, the paper is conjecture A prime is always okay. So the theorem for today, the research theorem, so this is to myself and uh, Austin Simpson, who's a grad student at the University of Illinois Chicago, um, conjecture A prime is fine. Now, I would like to give and I, some indication of what's going on in the proof, because like a lot of mathematics, especially when it comes to something that stumped people for some time or was left open for a while, um, what goes on in the proof is usually much more interesting than the actual statement of the theorem. And I want to give some indication of what we actually accomplish. Um, it's pretty pretty neat. So, so, um, so I'll just call this our approach, the approach. All right, so what we do is, all okay, right, so we have our canonical divisor. All right, and so what we can do is we can, you know, you know we can choose oh, canonical divisor and we're gonna assume R mod XR is that pure and normal. And we're gonna choose KX such that how, we can choose this in a very special way, such that R of KX is just a, is isomorphic to a canonical ideal. All right, so this is canonical ideal. And uh, we could do this in a way so that the height one components of J are completely disjoint from the height one components of X. And so the way to say this, um, and X is a non-zero divisor, on R mod J, that's, there's no problem making this happen. 
And so this is equivalent to saying that um, you can take J, you can take any symbolic power of it you like, and if you mod out by X, J symbolic I, it, this is actually isomorphic to, to an ideal of R mod XR. All right. And I want to point out, this is going to be an ideal of height one of R mod XR. All right. All right, so now what do we do with this information? So we know we're dealing with a Q Gorenstein ring. So we're going to say the Q Gorenstein index is n times p to the e. And p, we've done this in a way where p doesn't divide n. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the ideal i. is going to be the, the nth symbolic power of the canonical ideal. All right. Now, since J symbolic NP to the E is a principal ideal, this implies if you ever take the ith symbolic power of I and then take its P to the E symbolic power, you're just going to get another principal ideal and it's going to be X to the I. Okay. So I just want to keep in mind as we're moving forward that all when we fix this ideal I, it has this property that if you ever take a P to the E symbolic power of it or any multiple of P to the E, you're always going to get a principal ideal. Fine. And so what we do is we're going to consider the following ring. Um, so we're going to we have a ring R, and we're going to consider how it maps into this uh, blow-up algebra. So to speak. So I T. So T is a variable. I squared T squared. Right. So this is just the Reese algebra. Right. But I don't want to do the Reese algebra. I want to do the so-called symbolic Reese algebra. So this next step would be in degree three would be I symbolic three, T cubed, and so forth. Now these rings, very complicated. Usually um, can be non Noetherian. They can be the, the very fascinating objects. But under the Q-Goinstein condition, this thing is clearly an Ethereum, and it's generated by elements of degree less than or equal to P to the E. So because uh, I symbolic P to the E is principal, um, if we call this big ring, I don't know, T, this symbolic Reese algebra T, um, T is generated by elements of degree elements of degree less than PDE. Okay, so it's actually a no theory in algebra. And moreover, what we can do is form a quotient of this thing. So what we're gonna call S, and S is gonna be the so-called, well, it's gonna be T. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna mod out by the principal ideal. So we look in degree P to the E. So in degree P to the E, we're looking at I symbolic P to the E, which is generated by the single element X. And we're going to set that one element, the generating element in degree P to E, equal to one. And this forms the so-called cyclic cover of R with respect to the ideal I. So S is a, I'll just call it a cyclic cover. Now, why should we care about this ring? Why is this natural to look up? So properties of S. All right, so maybe key fact one is S is going to be normal, is normal domain. Um, let's call this P1. Property one, S is a normal domain. Q, and it's going to be Q Gorenstein of index um, uh, N, which is not divisible by P. So just remember that. Two property key property number two is that uh, R is F pure if and only if S is F pure. So remember, we're aiming to show we want to show R is F pure. Now, this result. Um, let me make some comments about this result. So this implication, the reverse implication, is trivial is easy uh, because R is a direct sum and of 
S. So I should point out as a module, S decomposes pretty nicely. It's a finite extension. And, it, and what's effectively happening is when you set the P to the E degree stuff inside that symbolic Reese algebra equal to zero, you end up forcing all the higher degree stuff to be zero as well, just because it's generated by elements degree P to the E and less. Um, and so, uh, yes, but as a module, S decomposes as a, like this. Um, and so R is a direct sum and of S, and it's easy to show direct sum ands of F pure rings are F pure. But the other implication is, you know, this is originally due to, from a couple of sources. So, so Wadnavi is coming back into this conversation. Um, so he proved it that F pure, R is F pure implies S is F pure, but there was this, there was a, there was a, an assumption of the divisibility assumption. So this is provided the index of I, not divisible by P, but this thing has index P to the E by P, uh, but I symbolic P to the E is principal, right? So it actually has, you know, the, the index is as divisible as P as you can get. So Wadnavi's stuff isn't gonna be enough here, but this was later pushed by a, Javier Carvajal Rojas outside of this condition, outside of the, 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 the characteristic assumption is not necessary. So we don't we get rid of that characteristic assumption. And then I also invite you um, after our notes are updated here in the next week or so. Um, so myself and Lynch I'm on are in our notes give a very down to earth concrete treatment of this result. Um, as well of the uh, of the full generality of Carl Rojas. Okay, so so the point is we want to show R is F pure. We have this other auxiliary ring, the cyclic cover, which we know R is F pure if and only if S is F pure. But S has the really nice property of being Q Gorenstein of index not the divisible by P. Right? So we have a commutative diagram R to S to R mod XR to S mod SX. So this is a commutative diagram. And we know that this is F pure. Okay. And so to so we to show at R is F pure. R is F pure. It is enough for S mod XS to be a cyclic cover. Cover of R mod XR. Indeed. So if R mod XR is F pure and S mod XS is a cyclic cover, then that would imply, right? So you know, if R mod XR, S mod XS, cyclic cover, this implies then by a um, property two applied to R mod XR that S mod XS is F pure. So this is the Watanabe um, Carvajal Rojas result. And then that would imply by property one, since the Q Goinstein index is not divisible by P, that S is F pure. Since we already know that F purity deforms out, out in, uh, provided the index is not divisible by P, which then implies R is F pure, since R would be a direct sum end. Yes. So, how do we show, like, why, like, you know, so, so, what does it take for S mod XS to be a cyclic cover? So, if you look at the decomposition of this thing, so this is R mod XR, direct sum I mod X, I, all the way up to I symbolic P to E minus one mod X, I symbolic P to E minus one. Now I symbolic I mod X, I symbolic I is isomorphic to I symbolic I, X mod X. And what we have to show, I symbolic I, X, X is unmixed of height one. This is what we have to do to show it's a cyclic cover. 
type one as an ideal of R mod XR. All right. So now for those who have dealt with cyclic covers or dealt with these type of things, this is this type of condition that this thing being unmixed of height one is if and only if it's going to amount to showing that I mod I X I sum of I is an S2 R mod XR module, which would have to imply then that I symbolic I has depth at least three, depth greater than or equal to three as an R module. And this type of thing should make people concerned, right? You know, producing ideals with depth bigger than two is not really expected unless you're dealing with like a principal ideal. But let me tell you why this is natural to expect in an F-pure ring. So why is this natural? This natural to expect. Right, so I'm not proving it, but I'm, I'm just want to argue that this is a legitimate and the correct idea, the correct approach to this problem that nobody else, I think, really considered. So why is this natural to expect? Well, we expect Fe lower star R to have a free sum. So we, this would then imply, all right, so I'm going to do some tricks that we did last week. We can then tensor with I symbolic I. Okay, and then this thing, all right, oh, and then I'm going to reflexify where star, blank star is homing into R. So if you take the reflexive whole, the thing on the left side simplifies to Fe lower star I symbolic I PV. This was this thing of bringing in a divisorial ideal but twisting by PV. But if this thing is, of course, of in, we argue that I symbolic to anything of multiple PDD is a, produces R of the isomorphism. And so we expect all of these ideals to be direct summands of F equals star R. Expect isomorphic I to be summand of F equals star R, which, so we expect these ideals to have high depth. And this is the type of stuff that we do. We, we provide the right depth conditions to, to force the, the, the base change of the cyclic cover to actually base change to a, to a cyclic cover of R mod X. And that, that's the key point. And we really had to exploit the fact that these ideals had symbolic powers. Uh, P to the E produces principal ideals. That was very important. So, OK, I think I ran about two minutes over time. I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas. We will take questions. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, Thomas, this is Arindam. Oh, hey. Arindam. How's it going? Hey. Yeah, pretty good. Uh, actually, I have a tangentially uh, sort of related question. So in q currency rings, all for all ideals, the symbolic Riesz algebra is Noetherian? No, 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 no. Only, uh, oh, the, 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 no, no, no. Definitely not necessarily. Uh, only. Okay. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, but uh, certainly anything that's uh, torsion in the class group will produce okay. a sim uh, finally generated algebra. But yeah, not every symbolic restring. I mean, and especially if you start looking at ideals of different height. I don't know if you're only talking about height one ideals, but there's even you know in regular rings, the dimension D, there's height D minus one ideals that produce non no theory and symbolic Riesz algebras. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I just wanted to get that clarified. Okay, thank you. Hmm? I have a naive questions. 
Uh, yes. The classical singularities are studied using some numerical invariants like multiplicities and uh, invert coefficients and mm -hmm. so for these singularities we do have some numerical criteria, right? And uh, for these singularity classes, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, you're asking if there are numerical. Ah, right. And so yeah. why why we don't approach uh, these problems by computing the numerical criteria? Oh. oh, no, we do. We do. It's just the problem is much harder. So there's, there's more to be said. So um, so let me I'll very briefly say something, at least in the F regular case. Um, no, no, we, we do. But it's just a much harder thing to do. Um, uh, uh, and other people have done this as well. So let me just talk about F regular. So, so F regular rings. So, right. So F regular. So there's this numerical invariant called the F signature. So F bar equals the F signature. And what this is as a limit is you take the the the, the largest free sum end of largest rank of sum end free sum end of F e lower star R. And normalize this by the largest number of free summons you could have, which is just the rank. And if you take this limit, you produce a number called the F signature. And this number is always between 0 and 1. And S of R is positive, definitely of F regular. And so what you can do then is there's a couple things that you can do here. Is one, you can try to relate you know, uh, S of R with S of R mod XR. If, you know, so, right, so you could try to show that S of R mod XR is positive implies S of R is positive, right? That would be a way to approach the deformation problem of regularity. And you could do this. Uh, this is done very nicely for Gornstein rings. Uh, this type of stuff is going to be done. Uh, will follow for work in Gornstein rings by work between myself and uh, Ilya Smirnov. And then it's done for cube Gornstein rings. Actually, you don't even need this much. Well, no, you need this much for at least this problem um, by uh, Ilya Smirnov and Alexandra De Stefani. They, they'll study their, their type of work to do these things. Um, yeah. yeah. And then there's. The, uh Yes. May I ask you a question? Of course. Uh, uh, so perhaps I may missed something of your talk, but you, so you take, so starting from R, which mm -hmm. is F pure, and take cyclic cover S. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so you claim that. Uh, if R is F pure, then also S is F pure. And yes. even if, yeah, so yes. covering order is. Oh, yes. yes, yes, okay, it's very nice. Mm -hmm. And how about F regular? Oh, and F regular is fine too. And we, we do this okay. in the Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, and that's yeah. nice. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, it's to give an indication. I mean, mm. one of the big things that we show is that, it, well, I, I don't want to go into it. We don't have to go into it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, we do get a very concrete treatment of mm. the notes. Okay. Thank you. And thank you very much for your nice talk. Thank you, Professor Wan. Any other questions for Thomas? So the main open problem is about F injectivity, whether that oh. 
Ah, yes. I mean, oh yeah, I did write that up there. Yes. Uh, yeah, F injectivity deforming is that's still the big open one out of those four. So yeah, the the, the three F singularity classes. Yeah. F regular, F pure, F rational. I, I would argue we have a very solid understanding of the deformation problem. But yeah, F injective is still been a nightmare. Yeah. But are there numerical criteria for F injectivity? None that I know of. Off the top of my head. No. I mean, using Frobenius closure of parameterization. Well, yes, there is definitely attempts like that with Frobenius closure by fields. There's a really nice ah, that reminds me. Yes, there's uh, Shimamoto uh, and Fem Hong Kui have a really wonderful paper about exactly that line of work. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, I'm not going to try to summarize the results because I haven't thought about it in some time. Um, but yes, no, there is there are there is work along that lines. Yes, yeah. Frobenius closure that fields. Right. I suppose the problem is to lift the Frobenius closure from R mod X, mm -hmm. or the, even from R to R, R to R mod X. There is no problem, but from R mod X to R, how to lift the Frobenius closure of a parameter? Yeah, yeah. That's the. Yeah. That's the hard part. Yeah, and uh, not having, yeah, and if your local cohomology models, like your lower ones have non-finite conditions, like you have really bad depth properties, so to speak, um, it, it just gets so hard. It's really amazing how hard that problem is, uh, especially considering how easy the Cohen-McCauley case was. Yeah. So, yeah, it's so amazingly frustrating. Even the Hugh Gorenstein condition is of no use in that situation? Of no use, yeah, no. Because, I mean, imagine taking like a cyclic cover of an F injective ring. Chances are you're going to produce like a Gorenstein or quasi Gorenstein ring. And um, if you do it with respect to the canonical ideal, and um, if that thing was F injective, uh, right, that thing would be F and pure, which would imply R was F pure. And you just yeah, I, I don't see any way to use a cyclic cover for these reasons. Yeah. Right. right. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, I believe I, we have no further questions. Uh, so, Thomas, thank you very much for uh, giving two talks and giving a very interesting survey uh, of these problems. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for coming online. Yeah. Of course, thank you for having me. I'll see you all around. Yeah. Bye bye.